Thanks for joining this episode of the number 86 lecture series, which continues the conversation in the 85 Federalist Papers about the proper structure of government. Today's episode features constitutional law scholar, Michael William McConnell. He served as a United States Circuit Judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the 10th Circuit from 2002 until 2009. Since 2009, Professor McConnell has served as Director of the Stanford Constitutional Law Center at Stanford Law School. As always, the Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Today we're joined by Professor Michael McConnell to learn about different influences on the Founding Fathers, which led to the innovations in the Constitution. Who were the main political thinkers read by the Founders? What role did the English common law tradition play in their experience? Setting up a proper structure for government is the very first and most important aspect of creating a, a constitutional regime. Uh, the structure is necessary in order to uh, channel the public will. We need to know uh, when elections are going to take place. We need to know who people are voting for. Without having a structure of democratic governance, you can't even begin to have uh, a republic. And the uh, framers believe the division of power was the most important and effective way of hitting that middle ground uh, between uh, a government that was going to be powerful enough to be able to serve its ends but not so uh, powerful that it would be a, a danger to people's liberties. And the uh, operating theory, uh, which the framers took primarily from the Scottish Enlightenment, but also from historical experience, was that creating a division of power and checks and balances was the best way to accomplish that. The Framers of the Constitution differ among themselves just as we differ among ourselves. Uh, I think sometimes students today are inclined to think of them all as just, you know, dead white men wandering around in funny looking wigs and, and so forth, and they must all agree, but in fact their disagreements were quite profound. The Constitution reflects sometimes compromise and sometimes combination uh, of views. Uh, some of the principal uh, views that you see in the constitutional debates uh, at the founding included uh, traditional republicanism, uh, which was the view that government is best when it is conducted by, by the people themselves with as little interference as possible, but with the understanding that that kind of government is only uh, going to be a good form when the people are virtuous. And so there needs to be a heavy emphasis upon the inculcation of public virtue. And by virtue, what they really meant was voluntary self-sacrifice for the common good. They didn't mean, you know, behaving yourself. They meant uh, things like, uh, you know, serving in the militias and undertaking heroic and courageous uh, efforts for the common good. An alternative view that I think Hamilton and Madison, among others, tended to have came from the Scottish Enlightenment. And the Scottish, and particularly figures like Adam Smith and David Hume, but also others, they believed that it's a mistake to assume that anybody is going to be over-endowed with the public virtue. That, uh, in fact, David Hume said that it's best to presume that all men are knaves. And they taught that the best way form of government is one in which you channel a self-interest and ambition in ways that will uh, approximate the common good that you set up. This is where the idea of checks and balances really comes from, is that you, you understand that the players in the system are going to be self-interested and ambitious, and you try to set things up so that their ambition will counter ambition, to use a Madison's phrase from the, from the Federalist. Factions will necessarily exist, but uh, the solution to faction is to extend the sphere so, th so there'll be a mul multiplicity of factions and they can uh, control uh, each other. You also see, I believe, in at least some figures, the influence of uh, Thomas Hobbes, 
and his uh, theory of government set forth in The Leviathan, in which the most important thing that government does is protects against both internal and foreign violence. And, and you need to have a government in which a lot of power is concentrated in a single figure, like the president, and uh, in which sovereignty uh, includes a control over what, what Hobbes teaches is uh, over the two most important things are uh, the economy, which means regulation of the economy and taxation, but also the instruments of force, which would be uh, the army. And they didn't have a police force back then, but uh, the forces of, uh, of domestic uh, law enforcement. And that when those things are not held firmly in the grip of the government, you have either invasion or anarchy. So you can see, I think, you know, Alexander Hamilton, to some extent, seems to be uh, influenced there. But uh, many of the arguments between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists had to do with whether the national government would in fact have control over those two uh, areas. And the Federalists insisted that the national government really had to have uh, a potential for being, uh, for having uh, control over those things that Hobbes said were, uh, were essential to sovereignty. John Locke's views were uh, prevalent at the time and, and revered at the time of the framing by many, not only his theory of revolution, but also his understanding of natural rights. You can see uh, in his, his description of the state of nature as one in which you know, everyone, has, everyone owns themselves and they own the product of their labor. Uh, and they are free to do whatever they want so long as they don't interfere with the uh, equal rights of others. And this would be some kind of a libertarian utopia, except for the fact that uh, rights are uncertain. You have powerful people who beat up on others and take their stuff and, and, uh, and enslave them. Locke says that there are actually three principal defects in, this, in the state of nature. One is the absence of an agreed upon law. A second is an uh, absence of a fair and objective uh, adjudicator in the case of conflict. And the third is the lack of somebody to enforce the results if there is an adjudication. Those three defects of the state of nature can be just directly translate into articles one, two, and three of the, of the Constitution, creating a lawmaker, a law enforcer, and a law uh, interpreter. Montesquieu is another source of ideas that uh, he's cited as often, I believe, as any other single source other than the Bible at the convention. And Montesquieu is mostly important for federalism. Montesquieu believed that it was not possible to have a single unified comprehensive government over a large, large and diverse territory. The only way to have Republican government over such a large expanse was to divide power uh, among provinces and in a kind of confederation. This is where our notions of federalism principally uh, come from. That doesn't exhaust the sources of intellectual uh, fermentation that came to the Constitution, but that at least is a sketch of just how diverse their thinking was. You've just discussed some of the influences on our founding fathers. Can you tell us more about that? What key sources of ideas about government did our founders bring with them to Philadelphia in the summer of 1787? How did these ideas impact the drafting of the Constitution? The f most important source of ideas of, about government that the framers brought with them to Philadelphia came from British constitutional history and experience. They had, until 10 years before, been the subjects of the king and citizens of the British Empire, and they admired a lot about it. Just because we had a revolution against the king and against the empire doesn't mean that they thought that everything uh, in the British system should be rejected. They were quite discriminating. They imitated major features of the British Constitution, and they deliberately rejected major features of the Constitution. It's amazing how 
how wise a lot of those choices appear even in retrospect. I'm not saying that they were perfect and that every decision was right, but that they they did use the British constitutional experience in a, in a way which seems very compelling uh, even today. So what were some of the things that they borrowed. They borrowed the idea of having an executive which is separate from the parliament. Uh, they borrowed the idea of a parliament with two different branches, uh, one of them quite dependent on the people and responsible to the people and the other less so. And that was what we got with the House and, and the Senate. Uh, they borrowed the idea of life tenure judges, which came in the British system came about in, in the 1702 Act of, of Succession. They were extremely attentive to the problems of how to govern a military because you know, 17th century Britain was a, you know, featured kings being able to abuse their authority over the military in order to oppress the people. And uh, the constitutional framers spent a lot of their time discussing how to structure uh, a military so that they, what they wanted was a very small national standing army, only authorized by the representatives of the people, only for short periods of time, and with the rules for the conduct of the armed forces all to be set by the representatives of the people, not by uh, the executive. The executive would be the commander in chief, but that meant you know the deployment of the military when hostilities had begun, authorized by Congress, but the rest of it would be democratically controlled. And more important than that, the bulk of the military power of the United States would be in the in the state level in the form of militias, which could then be brought into national service, but only under specified uh, circumstances. Another thing they borrowed was a lot of federalism comes from the British system, the relationship between the colonies and the crown. Our supremacy clause is uh, patterned on British imperial uh, constitution. What were some of the things that they rejected? So they greatly reduced the uh, prerogatives of the king, assigning many of those to uh, uh, to Congress instead. They eliminated any hereditary feature uh, to the government. They wanted a natural aristocracy, but they did not want a hereditary aristocracy. Uh, they greatly increased the suffrage. And at that time, about one in 10 white adult males were permitted to vote. Uh, in America, it was going to be something more like uh, nine out of 10. Uh, so greatly increasing suffrage. And then if you look at the amendments to the Constitution, it's been by far the most important. Uh, numerous of the amendments have been extensions of the vote to more and more people to the point that we now have something like universal adult suffrage, uh, which it was you know, unheard of. Uh, before. Also, the, the federalism that they created had some resemblance to the British Empire, uh, but was very different from the internal governance of the United Kingdom itself. In Britain, the subordinate institutions, uh, you know, like the counties and shires, were simply administrative units of the national government. They were not independent governing units. They could not their leadership was appointed from the center and could not were not competitive sources of independent authority the way the states were intended to be. So that is something that looks manifestly different uh, from the uh, British experience. Britain also had no written constitution, so the very existence of a written constitution is a departure from uh, British norms. And if you think of the Bill of Rights as part of the original Constitution, even though it was brought about several years uh, thereafter, there was uh, nothing comparable to that. Uh, the way Madison describes this is he says that in Britain, all of the struggles for the freedoms of the people were conceived as struggles between the powers of the king and the powers of parliament. 
And uh, he said that in here in this country, the Constitution would be superior to the laws and the law is superior to the prerogatives of the executive. So he envisioned uh, a constitutional order which was superior to even parliament at a time when the prevailing view of the British constitution was, was one of parliamentary supremacy. So there are many ways in which they departed just as there were many ways in which they uh, uh, borrowed from the British experience. Can you tell us more about the British experience? Specifically, how did the three different forms of power, legislative, executive, judicial, work? They didn't match the three branches of government in the U.S. Constitution. How did our founders reconfigure them in our constitutional design? Well, the framers of the Constitution were of two minds about the legislature. On the one hand, as as good Whig figures and anti-royalists uh, who you know cut their eye teeth on opposition to the king, uh, they wanted the legislature to be uh, the principal policymaker for the new government. They believed that the legislature more directly represented the people uh, and that its deliberative character made it the natural sort of focal point of policymaking. But they also had had, had, had experience uh, in the state legislatures between independence and the calling of the Constitutional Convention in which they those legislatures were turbulent, they changed their minds all the time, they were uh, not respectful of, of minority rights or property rights or individual liberties. And so they believed that the legislature needed to be structured in a way that had more checks and balances. That, and so they wanted longer terms for the legislature, they wanted the executive to have a veto. Uh, they wanted to have two branches of the legislature so that the two branches could uh, check one another. Uh, and they wanted to specify specifically what powers the legislature was going to be able to, to carry forward. One of the ways that they did all of this decision making is that they looked at the British model and where governmental power lay then. And a, there was a great deal of power still was with the crown at the time of the Constitutional Convention. And they, the founders carefully considered each of the royal prerogative powers uh, and parceled them out between the king and Congress. And interestingly, giving a great deal of royal authority over such things as being able to declare war or grant patents uh, to Congress. So a lot of Congress's powers were ones that were exercised by the king under the royal government. But then they created a president uh, who would be able to control uh, and, and check some of the abuses if the, executive, if the legislative branch went too far with us. So this is where the, the veto uh, uh, came from. And uh, they also expected uh, that the uh, executive branch, the president, would execute the laws in a way which would, which would bring a more national perspective and might soften some of the excesses uh, of legislative activity. So of all the institutions of government, the presidency was the hardest for the framers to figure out because they simply had no experience of a powerful national executive other than a king. And they did not want a king, but on the other hand, they did appreciate the importance of having a single executive to administer the laws with what they called energy, secrecy, and dispatch. That is, somebody can operate quickly and powerfully not having to operate through a, a committee. And so they didn't quite know how to do that. There was, there was a lot of backing and forthing about this. The original Virginia plan envisioned an extremely powerful president, uh, one who would have powers over war and peace, that is to take us to war. That was unacceptable. And so the convention in early June created a very weak president with very few powers. And they didn't return to the question until uh, uh, after the middle of the summer, 
and they began crafting a presidency with very substantial independent authority. But again, at the beginning, or at least at the end of, of July, the president did not have power over foreign relations. He was commander in chief of the army, but the Senate was going to have authority over foreign affairs, sending ambassadors, determining uh, foreign policy and the like. So it's really only toward the end of the convention uh, that the powers over some of the most important executive powers over foreign affairs were, uh, were transferred to the president. One of the biggest conflicts that Parliament had had with the English king was over the king's practice of what they called dispensing or suspending uh, the laws. This is where the king just simply refused to carry out or to enforce laws passed by Parliament. And this was the main reason why James II was, uh, was driven out of, out of the country. And the first two provisions of the English Bill of Rights declare that the executive, the king, did not have the power to either suspend or, or dispense with the law. And our framers certainly wanted to carry through that reform. They, they believed that when a law was passed by Congress and signed by the president, uh, that the president had an obligation to uh, enforce it. And this is reflected in the language of the take care clause of Article Two which says that the president shall take care that the law be faithfully executed. Now, that doesn't mean that every law is going to be enforced 100% of the time. You think of something as a homely example like the speed limit on the highway. If, if every person who were speeding was, was pulled over, then... Uh, uh, well, most of us would be in jail most of the time. So there is and necessarily has to be prosecutorial discretion. And so when the take care clause refers to faithfully executing the law, what that means is to deploy the resources of, the, of law enforcement to do the best job we can of reasonably and faithfully executing the law. It means that we don't use prosecutorial discretion as a policy instrument when uh, the president may disagree with a law passed by uh, Congress. Now, unfortunately, this happens from time to time. Uh, Richard Nixon, for example, used prosecutorial discretion uh, in the civil rights area uh, to frustrate part of Title VI of the, of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and the courts uh, called him uh, on that. And I think there are also good reasons why, why the Supreme Court is a better decision maker with respect to questions of constitutionality. And so there is, I think this is going to be an enduring uh, source of friction uh, between the executive and the other branches uh, as to exactly how far presidents can go in enforcing the Constitution simply on their own authority. So. In, in our system, we don't, unlike some European countries, we do not have a constitutional court that is charged with enforcing the Constitution. We just have courts, and what they're charged with is resolving cases or controversies. Those are uh, you know, actual legal disputes between real people involving real things. Now, the Constitution may well be an issue in one of those cases or controversies. Uh, and when the court is deciding them, they may have to interpret the Constitution. And sometimes they're going to have to say that a statute or an act of the executive branch is inconsistent with the court's reading of the, of the Constitution and the superior law is going to prevail in that case or controversy. That's the court's authority. And the, what that means as a practical matter is that there are a large number of constitutional questions that are, won't come before the court, and some of them can never come before the court uh, because they're never going to present themselves in the form of an actual case or controversy between uh, real people who are affected by it. And so a lot of constitutional law is actually resolved by the legislative and executive branches uh, and sometimes in conflict with one another 
for example, uh, the reach of the spending power uh, is a constitutional question, and it's been debated heavily. It was one of the most important questions uh, during the sort of Henry Clay versus Andrew Jackson period of American politics. Uh, Henry Clay took the view that Congress should have high tariffs and, and do a lot of uh, spending on internal improvements. And Andrew Jackson and his party favored low tariffs and said that it was not constitutional for Congress to spend on many uh, of those projects. All of that was argued in constitutional terms, but none of it could ever get to court because you don't have two people uh, or you know, real people with a case or controversy uh, arising over that. I think there are basically two ways of seeing the role of a court in a democratic society. Uh, you can have a strictly legal view of the court, or you can have a more policy or philosophical role for uh, the court. In the one, the court is simply a court of law. It interprets statutes according to their uh, intended meaning. It interprets the Constitution according to, to its understood meaning. Uh, they exercise as little personal discretion as possible. Their job is to enforce rules that have been set down by others. The alternative way of thinking about a court is that it's really more like the House of Lords. That is, it's an aristocratic body uh, that decides questions on the basis of its own views and conscience, uh, and often in ways which are different from those of the, of the common people. So you have issues like uh, issues that the Constitution does not appear to address, like uh, abortion or same-sex marriage or punitive damages or uh, grandparent rights. Uh, and the court takes it upon itself to, to overrule the decisions of the representatives of the people based upon uh, more abstract philosophical or moral uh, principles. Those are two very different things. I think the court in the more legalistic sense is entirely consistent with uh, democracy. I think that the court in the second sense uh, is actually an aristocratic uh, limitation or check upon democracy. To wrap up now, we've discussed constitutional design. One thing we haven't touched on yet, what does the Constitution say about the mechanics of the democratic process? So one of the oddities of the U.S. Constitution is how little it has about the mechanics of the democratic process itself. You know, there are some rules. Uh, we know, for example, that the states are going to decide for themselves how to do districts, how to conduct elections, what the voter qualifications are going to be, subject to Congress's ability to uh, pass supervening legislation regarding the governance of, of federal elections. Uh, but that's not a lot. That doesn't tell us uh, how districts are going to be formed. It uh, doesn't tell us, uh, well, we do know a very important thing, which is how often elections are going to be, and that itself is a huge advance, right? Uh, the fact that we hold regular elections rather than allowing governments just to stay in power forever is a huge advance for democracy. Uh, but a lot went unspecified. I think if we were to write a constitution today, we would be almost certain to include provisions about things like candidate selection. Are we going to have a primary system or not? Probably we would be interested in constitutionally specifying uh, single member districts and first past the post elections and uh, our presidential elections would probably not be governed by the Electoral College. I don't know that for sure, but I doubt that would pass uh, uh, today if we were to uh, be starting from scratch. So a lot of the law, what we call the law of democracy when, when we teach this in law schools is, is the product of longstanding practice and of judicial innovation rather than actual interpretation of the Constitution. Thank you for listening to this episode of the number 86 lecture series. The spirit of debate of our founding fathers animates all of the number 86 content. 
encouraging discussion and critical reflection relative to how each subject is widely understood and taught in law schools and among law students. Subscribe to the Number 86 Lecture Series on your favorite podcast platform to have each episode delivered the moment it's released. You can also go to fedsoc.org forward slash number 86 for lectures and videos on federalism, separation of powers, the judiciary, and more. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash N-O-8-6. Thanks for listening. See you in class.